front row. So please uh, come and join them. All right, this is an operation where we start things right on time, we'll be stopping on time, we'll have our breaks on time. So just to kick things off, um, I'm Michael Scharf, the Associate Dean for Global Legal Studies here at the Law School, and I'm going to be the MC in the morning, and next to me is Michael Kelly. He is the President of the International Association of Penal Law, and also the Associate Dean at Crichton Law School, and he will be um, doing some presentations in the morning and then being the MC in the afternoon. Um, and I just want everybody to see your face. So my first uh, order of business is to bring our dean down for the welcome address. And so I want to introduce Dean Lawrence Mitchell, who's been with us now for just over a year and has been doing transformative and visionary things at the law school. But without further ado, let me bring in Lawrence Mitchell. Good morning. Um, one of the privileges that I have as dean here is to welcome you to events like this. Um, and this is a truly extraordinary event. Uh, thank you all for being here. With our endowed Frederick Cox International Law Center, which celebrated its 20th anniversary last year, our school has long been a leader in international law. Based on its survey of American international law professors, US News and World Report, which we sometimes look at and sometimes don't, <laughs> ranked our international law program among the top 11 in the country this year. That's when we look at it. Um, but that was last year, and we still have a lot of work to do. Since I became dean 15 months ago, we developed an ambitious China law program, partnering with six of China's most prestigious law schools, with an additional five online to be added this year. We've also created with Peking University a new think tank, the Sino-American Law and Commerce Institute, which will be getting operations shortly. We're also working to develop relationships in India, Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, Australia, and Africa, every continent but Antarctica. <laughs> and my colleagues have been so successful that I think I'll be returning to the United States sometime in 2014. <laughs> We've expanded our LLM program from 50 to 87 foreign lawyers, with 59 alone coming from China. And this semester, we're hosting six Chinese exchange students and two Russian exchange students. We've added new international law experts to the full-time faculty. And I recently appointed the organizer of this event, the inimitable, unduplicable Michael Scharf, <laughs> to the newly created position of Associate Dean for Global Legal Studies. This timely and thoughtful symposium, which is being webcast live around the globe, is the kind of event for which we've become known. Ohio is ground zero for this year's presidential election, and as election day approaches, foreign policy and national security issues are becoming increasingly important to the electorate. While his opponent charges that the president has diminished American leadership in the world, the New Republic recently wrote that President Obama has pursued a classically Republican foreign policy. Some feel he could have done more to deal with the continuing attempted acquisition by Iran of nuclear weapons, the revolutions in the Middle East, and the continuing threat of terrorism. Others believe the president has gone too far in deploying military force in Libya without congressional approval, and in authorizing predator drones to hunt down and kill suspected terrorists abroad, including American citizens. Underlying these different perceptions are competing conceptions of the president's power in foreign affairs. To shed light where there has mainly been heat, we have assembled here two dozen of the nation's leading experts for this day-long symposium 
presidential power, foreign affairs, and the 2012 election. The symposium begins with a keynote address by Jack Goldsmith, former, former assistant attorney general in charge of the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel, and author of the critically acclaimed new book, Power and Constraint, The Accountability President After 9-11. The symposium also features Principal Deputy General Counsel for U.S. Trade Representative Bradford Ward, <coughs> who will speak on a panel organized by our own Giuselino Colares about the President's power to manage international economic affairs. One of the other privileges I get as Dean is to brag about our faculty, and I want to note our bench strength by also noting that participating in this symposium are my wonderful colleagues, Avi Cover, Bob Strasfeld, Jonathan Adler, Cassandra Robertson, and Jonathan Enton. I'm leaving anybody out? That's pretty good. Other panels will examine presidential power in a war without end, the war powers resolution of 40, and rendition and targeted killing of Americans. The conference concludes with a panel comparing the approaches of the presidential candidates to foreign policy. Organized and moderated by Elizabeth <coughs> Anderson, the executive director of the American Society of International Law, the final panel features Ambassador Pierre Prosper, who is the foreign policy advisor to the Romney campaign, and William Burke White, who is former deputy to the director of policy planning at the US Department of State. And of course, I'd like to thank all of the participants and moderators who grace our law school with such extraordinary talent. This symposium was made possible by a generous grant from the Wolf Family Foundation, which has sponsored our fall international law conference for the past eight years. On behalf of the law school, I want to spend my deepest gratitude to Jim Wolf and his family for their continuing support of our programs. I also want to take a moment to thank the following organizations which are co-sponsoring this event. The American Society of International Law, the American Branch of International Law Association, the American National Section of the International Association of Penal Law, the Cleveland Council for World Affairs, and the Public International Law and Policy Group. Who would have imagined that Cleveland would become a world center of international law? Thank you, Michael. As is our tradition, we begin with our annual international law conference with the presentation of the International Association of Penal Law's Book of the Year Award. It's my pleasure now to turn the program over to Michael Kelly, president of the American National Section of the International Association of Penal Law for the award presentation. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and enjoy the conference. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Dean. Um, uh, I'm Michael Kelly. Uh, I'm the president. I have the honor of serving as the fourth president of the U.S. National Section of L'Association Internationale de Droit Penal. That's the extent of my French. Um, we are a Paris-based uh, organization that has been around since 1924. Uh, it is a community of international criminal law judges, scholars, uh, and attorneys and professors. Uh, the U.S. National Section regularly co-sponsors symposia such as this. I think this is probably our what, 13th year co-sponsoring uh, this symposium at Case. Uh, we're also co-sponsoring another symposium November 11th and 12th at Washington University, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the International Criminal Court. Uh, and we co-sponsor a summer school each year at Nuremberg on international criminal law. Uh, so we really go to ground zero for that subject. Um, we encourage you to join the organization. Uh, there are membership forms out in the lobby uh, if you're interested in that, and there's also a sign-up sheet circulating around the room. Uh, please put your email address and contact information down if you'd like to receive more information about us and how you can participate uh, in some of these activities, including joining the U.S. National Delegation to the Five-Year Congress, uh, which regularly attracts about 1,000 jurists from around the world in Rio de Janeiro in 2014. Um, okay, now to business. Each year, uh, we uh, are happy to uh, award the Book of the Year Award. Uh, this year, we're also happy to have Layla Sadat with us, the winner from uh, last year, and Michael Newton, uh, who won the Article of the Year Award last year. Uh, the Book of the Year uh, is always a, a sort of a contentious contest. Uh, we had three wonderful candidates uh, that were published this year, and the review committee selected uh, all the missing souls 
uh, a personal history of war crimes tribunals by Professor David Sheffer of Northwestern University. Uh, David is with us today and he'll uh, receive his award in a minute, but I just wanted to uh, read to you what Sir Brian Urquhart, uh, the former Under Secretary General of the United Nations, had to say about David's book. David Sheffer was a central mover in the 1990s international assault on the world's architects of atrocity. The main weapons in this campaign were the international tribunals for former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Cambodia, and the newly established International Criminal Court. Sheffer's important and original book is a detailed and surprisingly personal account of a historic movement and the vital story of a revolutionary international investment in the struggle for a future of peace with justice. And David just informed me this morning that with uncharacteristically lightning speed, uh, this hardback book is coming out in paperback in December and in audio version in October, although he's not reading it. <laughs> so uh, that is testimony to uh, the impact that this book has had and is having uh, in our field. Um, and just on a personal note, I would add that it is a special treat for me to present this award to David because 17 years ago, Dave Sheffer was my professor at Georgetown University. Uh, and as his former student, I can testify to his dedication to teaching and educating the next generation of lawyers, even then when he was the attorney for Madeleine Albright and he would take the shuttle twice a week from New York down to Washington just to spend time with 30 kids who didn't appreciate him at the time, uh, and then get back on the shuttle and go back to New York. Uh, so thank you, David, on a personal note for your investment in us. And now please come down and receive your award. So now to really kick things off, we're going to have our keynote address. I could do a very long introduction um, of this next speaker, but he is by far the most well-known law professor in the United States. So I'm not going to say anything other than please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to our keynote, Jack Goldsmith. Thank you, Michael, very much. <clears throat> Thank you uh, to you and everyone at the Cox Center for inviting me and for organizing this conference. I have uh, earaches, so I can't hear very well, so I'm not sure if I'm talking too loud or not, well, not loudly enough, so let me know if I'm speaking at the wrong level. The title of my talk um, is the title of my book that, I, that was published in uh, last spring, Power and Constraint, the Accountable Presidency After 9-11. I'm not going to directly reiterate the themes of the book, um, but rather um, I thought I would talk about the themes of the book as they apply to the topic of this symposium. One of the themes of the book is that in the analysis of and predictions about pres the presidency and presidential power, the, um, the actual uh, occupant of the White House, the person of the president, the president's views, the president's aims, the president's beliefs, matter a lot less than the uh, structural considerations, such as uh, structural influences both within the government and without the government. Within the government, the way the government is organized, without the government, the other forces that act on the presidency, Congress, the courts, NGOs, and the like. And I'll come back to some of those themes in a moment. Um, the title of this conference uh, invites the question, what's at stake in this election? What's at stake in terms of presidential power and foreign affairs? And my basic answer to what's at stake is relatively little. I don't think that a whole lot turns on this election in terms of presidential power and foreign affairs. Now, that's not a claim about whether our Israel policy is going to change or whether our policy towards Iran or China will change, um, although I'm not expert in those fields, and it's very difficult. We know what President Obama's policies are. 
it's difficult at this stage and preparing for this lecture, I, I read a lot about what people think Mitt Romney's foreign policy is, and that, frankly, there's no one really knows. There's a debate about uh, exactly what he thinks on these issues and uh, who, whether he's a moderate or a neocon and the like. So I think it's hard to predict those things. Rather, I'm going to focus on uh, topics that are uh, for fall more than the kin of what lawyers do and what lawyers think about uh, national security law, presidential power, and foreign relations law. And um, I don't think that we can tell what's going to happen next January in those areas of national security law, foreign relations law, and presidential power by looking at campaign speeches. I don't think we can tell what's going to happen uh, in those areas by reading the party platforms. For one thing, the Republican platform says hardly anything about those issues. But even if it did, I don't think we could, we could put much stock in it as a prediction about what's going to happen next year. Um, and if you think that that's an exaggeration, if you think that, 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 that the platforms don't matter, and if you think that my claim that I don't think there's going to be much difference between Obama and Romney uh, in terms of national security law after the election. If you think that's an exaggeration, think back to what President Obama promised uh, in his campaign. Think back to what President Obama promised uh, uh, during the campaign, what was in the Democratic platform. There were, he promised dramatic changes from the national security policies of President Bush, and he predicted that there would be, he claimed that there would be huge differences when he came into office. And in fact, as we all know now, there was relatively little change in national security law um, on issues ranging from military commissions to military detention to um, um, surveillance to state secrets to closing Getmo and the like. Many topics like that that I'll come back to again in a moment. Now, I don't believe, I didn't claim in my book, and I don't believe that Obama was just like Bush. Uh, he's not just like Bush at all. In fact, they have very different attitudes towards the presidency, also, obviously, and towards presidential power. They had very different attitudes towards law and lawyers. Um, one thing I think it's worth specifying is in trying to understand uh, what's going to happen in the next four years, regardless of who's president, I think it's important to understand what happened when, when Obama came in office and what happened in the last four years in the last transition, if there is a transition or the last, um, yes, the last transition. Um, it wasn't that Bush, that Obama <coughs> copied Bush's policies. That's not, the, not at all the right way to describe what happened. Rather, I think the accurate way to describe what happened, and this is suggested that there are longer, larger structural trends at work, the better way to describe what happened is that Barack Obama continued just about every trend that was happening at the end of the late of the Bush presidency, in the last two years of the Bush presidency. So, for example, in the last two years of the Bush presidency, because of things that Congress and the courts had done, and because of things that had happened inside the government, the Bush administration had significantly ramped down its interrogation program, its high-value interrogation program, and black site program, to the point where there was hardly anything going on in the program in the last two years. Um, that continued under Obama. Obama ended the program and, and narrowed the interrogation policies further, but it's important to see that that was a trend that had been going on for several years, arguably, probably since 2005. Another trend that Obama continued was ramping up targeted killings. This is not something that Obama invented. It was something that President Bush had begun to do much more aggressively in the last two years of his presidency, and there, so there was a trend of targeted killing towards the end of the Bush presidency. <coughs> President Obama ramped that up. Same is true, I believe, at least according to the newspapers, of proxy detentions. Uh, detentions in which the United States doesn't exactly hold someone, but asks a third party to hold a detainee, uh, basically for, for purposes for, for on, on behalf of the United States, or at least at the United States requests. That too had ramped up. The changes in military commissions. Military commission rules had been, had been being tightened during the second half of the Bush presidency. They were further tightened under Obama. So I think that the right way to understand, and there are other, other points about which that is true also. Surveillance had been on a course of, of tightening up. The surveillance <coughs> powers had been tightened up under the Bush presidency, and that continued under Obama. Um, so I think the right way to understand what President Obama did in terms of continuing the Bush policies was not to copy the Bush policies. He certainly didn't copy them. 
he put his stamp on them to some degree, but what was really happening was he continued all the trends, both pro-civil liberties and anti-civil liberties, or pro-presidential power and anti-presidential power, depending on how you look at it. Another big difference and an important difference between the Obama and Bush presidencies that might, that I'll come back to at the very end of my lecture, that it might also be relevant if President Romney wins, if, if Mitt Romney wins the presidency, um, and, and as a distinctive feature of the Obama presidency is his commitment to law, his commitment to the rhetoric of law and to taking le law and legal process seriously. Now, there are some exceptions to this that we can talk about in the question and answer if you want, but for the most part compared to President Bush, President Bush um, liked to talk about publicly and his, and his White House liked to talk about publicly about their aim to expand, they wanted to expand presidential power. And that, that was their goal. They said one of their goals was to expand presidential power. And often the, um, the rhetoric of the Bush administration was far out above, the far beyond the practice of the Bush administration in terms of what it was doing. But they weren't attentive to the need to, uh, they weren't attentive to the need to address concerns by the populace that they were acting extra legally or, aggr or aggr aggrandizing too much power. Obama, on the other hand, has never said he wants to expand presidential power. He always talks about uh, the limits on his power. He talks frequently about the constraints on his power. Um, and he has done, his administration has done a much better job at providing legal justifications and public legal justifications for what they have done than I think did the Bush administration. So those are some differences, and yet the differences are, I think, swamped by the similarities and outcomes. Very different, different approaches to rhetoric, very different approaches to the job, but very similar outcomes, continuing the trends, as I said. Now, President Obama is not the first president to come to power, to come to the presidency being a critic of executive power and then switching on the job and exercising powers that he proclaimed he wouldn't on the campaign trail or suggested he wouldn't. Presidents with names like Jefferson, Lincoln, Wilson, Eisenhower, and Clinton did the same. And don't forget, forget that George W. Bush said he was dead set against nation building on the campaign trail. Um, now these men are not liars and hypocrites in my view. I don't think Obama's a liar or a hypocrite. I think that there are strong structural factors that lead to two related things. One, and the, some of these points will be obvious, some I hope are less obvious. Strong structural factors that lead to two phenomena, related phenomena. One, every president tends to assert presidential power broadly. Every president does that. And two, and relatedly, there tends to be continuity across administrations in national security and foreign policy law. Tends to be. There's not always perfect identity, obviously, but there tends to be much more than is expected continuity across administrations um, um, then th there tends to be much more continuity than people expect. And there's always, we see president, at the beginning of a term, we see people being surprised that the president took a certain turn in national security or, or foreign relations law that looked like his predecessors. That seems to be surprising, but what's surprising is that people are surprised since it happens so often. <laughs> So what are these structural factors that lead to these continuities? Um, obviously, if President Obama wins the election, I believe that the policies will more or less continue, but my claim is that if Romney wins the election, that the policies won't change that much. So I'm gonna just list the structural factors that I think lead to these phenomena. One is, obviously, the responsibilities of the presidency and the old cliche that governing is much more difficult than campaigning. We all know this to be true. We, we say it's a cliche because it's so obvious, but we don't fully absorb it, in my opinion. Um, when, when, when one is the occupant of the Oval Office with the responsibilities for the security of the nation, and frankly, with the United States for the security of the world in many respects, and not just the national security, but the economic security and the like, the responsibilities and the decisions, the, the, the responsibilities are enormous. And those responsibilities tend to focus attention and they tend to focus the attention and maybe skew the analysis in favor of worrying about national security because who is the person that is invariably responsible when our security is breached? The President of the United States is invariably responsible when our security is breached. And that is an, a notion that many presidents have said they didn't fully understand the consequences of until they got in that Oval Office. 
So the responsibilities of the presidency focuses on the president's attention and leads the president to take national security much, much more seriously than he might have indicated on the campaign trail, or at least with a much greater priority than he might compared to other goals that he might have indicated on the campaign trail. Second and relatedly, when the president assumes the Oval Office, he gets access to national security information, foreign relations information that is not that the public is not privy to. The president knows a lot more about what's going on than the public does, and frankly, what the president sees is a lot scarier than what the public sees, much scarier. Um, and the, the, one has to learn to adjust to that, but the presidents do adjust to that, but the threat looks much greater from the inside than it does to the outside. That tends to lead presidents to emphasize and act aggressively and more aggressively in national security than they might have suggested they would do on the campaign trail. Third, every president, and relatedly again, every president assumes the perspective of the institution and, and the outlooks and practices of the institutions. When you're the chief executive, you are part of an institution that goes back to several centuries now, two, more than two centuries, part of an institution that has a life, that has a set of precedents and practices that have informed what that institution is and what it means and what it's supposed to accomplish. And no president is going to just discharge those practices, including the precedents and including the precedents that support the exercise of presidential power. Especially since, going back to the point about responsibility, the president has these enormous responsibilities to keep us safe and he's not going to avoid using tools available to him that have been available to other presidents to exercise those authorities if they're legally available. And I think that's, and I'll get back to this more in a second, but that's a lot of what explained uh, Obama's continuity with Bush. He got into office, the first three points, he got into office, the threat was much greater than he thought, than he anticipated. This is, they've made clear. The powers of the presidency at that point by January of 2009 were much broader than the rhetoric of the campaign had suggested because courts and Congress had weighed in. Another point I'll come back to in a moment. And he wasn't about to basically push those powers away when, if he, if he didn't think, if, and if he thought national security required that they be exercised. The fourth factor, something that's very important that leads to continuity is the bureaucracy, the national security and foreign affairs establishment and bureaucracy. The truth is that when a new administration comes in, there's turnover at the top, but not very deeply in the top. And, and the people, especially this is true in the military, but it's also true in the national security bureaucracy generally, CIA, for example, NSA, for example. For the most part, you have exactly the same people addressing exactly the same problems, collecting information, analyzing information, and sending information to the president. And, um, so, and so Obama was somewhat unusual in keeping a lot of Bush's people in place. Some of this is required by Congress or it's structural. So the FBI director's term was not up. So he kept Bush's FBI director. He kept on Gates. He kept on his uh, National Counterterrorism Center uh, director, Michael Leiter. There was actually a lot of continuity at the top of the Obama administration in important national security areas. But just below the surface, there was continuity as well. Just to take one example that I talked about in my book, the number two, when Panetta came in at the top of the CIA, his deputy was Stephen Kappas, the longtime number two person in the CIA, who was the person who had been running the very controversial black site and interrogation program. And who was, who was the general counsel for Leon Panetta? It was John Rizzo, 35-year veteran of the CIA, but also the lawyer under the Bush administration, who during most of the years of the Bush administration was the general counsel for the CIA then. Now, this is not, you can tell a nefarious story about the bureaucracy running things. I don't choose to tell that story. You can if you want. But the, real, the, the, the somewhat less, um, the, the point I want to make is, uh, I quote Rizzo in my book, John Rizzo, the, the general counsel I just mentioned, is saying something to the effect of, he's been, in the, he's been in the CIA general counsel's office for 35 years, and he said something to the effect that I've, for 35 years, I've seen administrations come in saying they're going to change everything. And then they look around and they see, you know, these problems that you're dealing with have been, ha dealing with have been thrashed around by people. The information, it leads to choices that are much narrower than you think. And the options for change simply aren't uh, as great as you might think. 
Um, so the persistence of the bureaucracy, of the national security bureaucracy, I think is one large important reason for, uh, for continuity across administrations in national security law. And then finally, I want to come to these larger constitutional forces that I think, uh, that I think um, lead to continuity. So one of the themes of my book, Power and Constraint, is that the, one of the reasons that Obama continued so much of the Bush policies as they stood in January of 2009 was that the Bush policies as they stood in January of 2009 had been dramatically changed over the last four or five years. And they had been dramatically changed in just about every area, from military commissions to military detention, surveillance, um, black sites, just about every important issue of national security policy, Bush's powers had been narrowed significantly. What had happened in those four and five years was, and this is a surprise to some, that our constitutional checks and balances had worked remarkably well. The courts engaged the president during wartime like never before and issued uh, decisions that in many respects narrowed presidential power in unprecedented ways. This was true in the Hamdi case in 2004, it was true in the Ham, which uh, recognized due process rights of, of enemy soldiers for the first time. It was true of the Hamdan case in 2006, which not only struck down the president's military commission, but also recognized that uh, contrary to the president's interpretation of the Geneva Conventions and without giving him any deference, also recognized that uh, common article three of the Geneva Conventions governed the war with Al Qaeda, that ruling had profound implications inside the executive branch. And also in 2008, when it held that the writ of habeas corpus as a matter of constitutional law extended to um, Guantanamo and that people in Guantanamo had the right to pursue habeas corpus remedies in courts in the United States. So courts are engaged much more than ever and all those rulings had the effect in combination with other factors of changing Bush's policies, moderating Bush's policies, in many respects, narrowing presidential power uh, and, and increasing the legitimacy of what was going on. So that's one of the things that had happened. And, one, and another that had happened is that Congress, contrary to popular opinion, was actually, to a remarkable degree, uh, involved in pushing back against the presidency um, in national security and war. This happened most significantly in 2005 in the Detainee Treatment Act when Congress um, closed a loophole in, in interrogation law that had the effect in 2005 of stopping the CIA's interrogation program. This was the Detainee Treatment Act that Bush issued a signing statement to in which he, he basically reserved the power to disregard the statute if he wanted. And it was a classic Bush administration move an assertion of a power verbally and rhetorically that they never did not exercise in that context, that led everyone to suspect that they would exercise it, that led everyone to worry and suspect what they were doing. In fact, what happened with the Detainee Treatment Act was the CIA director and general counsel told the White House, I'm sorry, we're not even going to continue the program after this because we don't think it's legal anymore. And they wouldn't do it. And they narrowed the program significantly after that. So, um, Congress had a big impact there. Congress had much more of an impact in narrowing and constraining the president in the Military Commissions Act of 2006 than I think it's given credit for. Congress in 2008 did give President Bush, this is President Bush at, his, at, his, the, the, at, the, at the lowest point of his presidency in the summer and uh, of one of the lowest points of his presidency in the summer of 2008, bipartisan Congress that Congress, excuse me, Congress gave the president large surveillance powers, but they did so with many internal checks and balances that, in my opinion, far significantly improved uh, the legitimacy and the efficacy of, of surveillance in the United States. Um, so Congress was involved in changing these programs. All of these things happened, these changes by courts and Congress, all of which were unprecedented because other forces were at work that are really new in wartime American history. The press was much more aggressive in reporting government secrets, in my opinion, than ever before. And many of the press reports of secrets that were about what was going on in the administration led to reform, I think led the Supreme Court to do what it did. NGOs were very powerful both in litigating claims that led to some of these landmark decisions and in criticizing the administration, extracting information, leading campaigns. So to go back to Bush 
to, to a why Obama continue Bush, and then I'm going to connect it up to um, this election. A lot, by the time Obama got to office in 2009, many of the Bush policies had been changed, sometimes quite dramatically, sometimes only a little, but they had almost all been to some degree legitimated. And so we were in a situation in 2009 where the president had been complaining and complaining and complaining about the Bush administration, but he was really attacking the Bush administration circa 2004, not the Bush administration circa 2009. Um, now these forces, so, that, so one reason why Obama continued the Bush policy is because these forces had legitimated a lot of what Bush was doing. Relatedly, these same forces that pushed back against Bush and that led Bush to the center, also pushed back against Obama when he did try to change national security policy in a serious way. Two things he tried most aggressively to do in, in furtherance of his campaign promises were to close Guantanamo Bay Detention Center and to um, try to reinstitute criminal trials, civilian criminal trials for people in Guantanamo Bay. And he was basically forbidden from doing either one of these things because Congress, again, by bipartisan majorities, prevented him from doing so. They passed laws that prevented him from doing so. The supposedly feckless Congress that can't do anything to the president in national security, which I think did a lot to push Bush to the center, also pushed back against Obama when he was going in the other direction, pushed him back to a place about where Bush was at the end of his second term. So there are these larger things going on, and I think that these larger forces, one of the reasons, the main reason, that I don't expect much change, whether Barack Obama wins or Mitt Romney wins in national security law, is because most of the basics, this is certain, there's still some important unopened, uh, uh, undecided issues, and there are going to be some new issues coming up, one of which I'm going to talk about. But for a lot of issues in national security law, we're basically doing normal science now, believe it or not. A lot of the issues have been thrashed out by Congress, by the courts, by the public. There's, there's a remarkable consensus in this country today about counterterrorism policies, supported by law, supported by Congress, supported by courts, and supported now by two presidents. And I don't think that consensus is going to change unless there's, of course, some external shock, like another attack or some other dramatic external shock. I don't think that general consensus is going to change regardless of who's the next president. So that's the main basis for my conclusion that I don't think much will change uh, with this election regardless of who wins. Now, I want to close by talking about structural considerations that I do think will lead. That it's not that all the structural considerations lead to continuity. There are some that, that lead to difference. And I want to close by talking about one. The presidents, what the populace, what the Congress think about the president and the president's priors and the president's beliefs and how much they trust the president on certain issues informs what the president can get away with and what the president can do in national security law. So George W. Bush was, had the reputation of being a cowboy, and when he did aggressive things, people worried about it because that was playing to type, and they, they worried when he started to do aggressive things that he was going to not be sufficiently controlled. But you heard very few people complaining when George Bush was doing soft things, like trying criminals in civilian courts, which he did all the time. No one complained about it. Very few people complained about it. Like releasing people from Gitmo, which he did hundreds and hundreds of times. No one complained about it. Very few people complained about it. Because the Democrats, this is, I'm generalizing grossly here, the Democrats liked the policy and the Republicans liked the president. That's too simple, but that's basically what explains it. Exactly the same thing in a mirror image happened with Barack Obama. When Obama who has a reputation for being the law professor committed to civil rights and law and the like, when he does soft things like try to close Gitmo, like try to have civilian trials for, uh, civilian criminal trials for people in Gitmo, everyone goes crazy. And it's not just Republicans, it's Democrats too. And a lot of this is politics, but a lot of it is, I think, informed by the trust of the president. On the other hand, I think Barack Obama has gotten much more of a free ride than George Bush did when he does aggressive things. So, for example, I think that the significant ramping up of the drone program, if it had happened under a Republican administration, would have been received by the Congress and by the people much differently than it has been. So, what are the implications of that point for the next election? 
if Obama continues in office, then that same phenomenon will play out. If Romney wins the presidency, we'll go back, I think, to something like the Bush phenomenon. I think Romney will have a little bit more leeway in releasing people from Gitmo, having civilian criminal trials, less leeway on doing aggressive things. And this leads me to the last point I want to make. And one of the, thing, one of the issues that I think is not completely resolved and is going to be an issue for the next president is the authorization to use military force and its increasing antiquation. The authorization to use military force, as, as most of you know, was enacted in September of 2011. It is the basic grounding for all of the things the president is doing in the war on terrorism, the war on terror. And that authorization was authorized the president to use all necessary and appropriate force against persons, against states, persons, and organizations who are responsible for 9-11. And that has been interpreted by presidents to include not only Al-Qaeda and Taliban, but associated forces with Al-Qaeda and Taliban. And the basis for everything we're doing in the war on terrorism, just about everything, not just in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but around the world, including in Yemen and Somalia and elsewhere, is the government is limited in its attacks by its interpretations of the limits of the authorization to use force. And I do believe that they are significantly constrained in that respect. The problem that the government faces is, is that the terror threat is morphing away from al-Qaeda and even from its affiliates. Is that the terrorist threat is moving towards what I call extra AUMF threats. And the problem for the executive branch is that the, uh, the authorization to use military force is increasingly unhelpful to the president in meeting the threats. There's a growing gap between the threat and what the AUMF authorizes the president to do. I think there's going to be a push for a new AUMF in the next four years. I'm quite confident that there will be. Um, and here's a prediction. If Barack Obama is president, you will get a much more pro-presidential power authorization to use military force, much more maybe too strong. This will never be provable, so I can't be disproved on this. <laughs> uh, it's a, uh, but, I, but my prediction is that if Obama's president, if and when the AUMF comes up, because he's trusted more on presidential power, and this is a relative claim, a lot of people don't trust Obama on presidential power as much as they did four years ago. But he certainly would be trusted more, I think, than Mitt Romney. And I think that you will get a more pro-presidential AUMF than you would if Mitt Romney were president, where the Democrats especially, are going, and, and in the libertarian wing of the Republican Party as well, is gonna be much more skeptical of, of granting uh, the president powers to go after new terrorist threats. And so the upshot of that prediction is, is that if you're worried about a new and expanded AUMF and you want a cabinet as much as possible, you should vote for Mitt Romney. Thank you very much. Now Jack has graciously offered to uh, entertain your questions for 15 minutes. We have two microphones up here. I need you to come down and line up. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation and ask a question and keep it short because that way many other people can uh, join in. If you're up in the overflow room, and I know there's about 60 people up there, please also come down during this period and ask your questions. Uh, so we'll start with Jabal. Uh, good morning, and uh, it's good morning. a real pleasure to have you here. My name is Jabal Shabalala. I'm a visiting professor uh, here. Uh, I teach at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Um, so I have two, a question about how you draw the line between discretion and, and legality. Because on some of these issues, we, I know, for example, with respect to the CIA decision not to continue the interrogation program, it strikes me that with the signing statement, what we, what we see there is, is an act of policy and discretion rather than and admitting an admittance on the part of the establishment there that there is actual legal, an actual legal barrier there. So it's an exercise yep. of discretion. Yep. And I wonder whether you think that that exercise of discretion has been, you know, is coextensive with the, the you know, sort of our concept of the legality of a lot yep. of the actions. And to then add to that, this concept of accountability. I mean, I think there's one of the biggest problems, I think, for a lot of people over the past 10 years is that even with so much that's been going on, so much that might have been considered illegal, or at least should have been investigated as 
illegal, many people would argue, the sense that there has been accountability or overreach or accountability beyond, I think, the political accountability, legal accountability, is that that's missing. That nobody has paid legal, a legal price, accountability price, for much of the action that took place, including, of course, the Seattle Black Site. Do you think this is partly a function of the presidential power to protect other executive officers, and that's one of the reasons why? Or is there simply more that this is more a political calculation, not, again, to exercise sort of prosecutorial discretion, not to investigate and to uh, prosecute? Okay, there's a lot there. Um, on the first question, um, when the C, so I hope this is a satisfactory answer. I think that the difference between legality and discretion, what you really are talking about is whether the president is going to admit that he's bound by a law. When the CIA went to the White House and said, we're not going to do this anymore, um, it didn't say we're not going to do this anymore as a matter of discretion. It said, we've interpreted the law, and we're just not going to do this anymore. We've been beat over the head enough. Now, that and so they were interpreting the law. Now, the president had a different view. But think about how remarkable that is. This is the president that supposedly believed in the unitary executive. And what the unitary executive means is the president is the chief law interpreter and he can order that interpretation on subordinates. That's not what happened here. One of his subordinate agencies in national security said, we've interpreted the law and we're just simply not going to do this anymore. I think that's law having an effect despite the fact that the president's advisor and by the way, that signing statement was completely open-ended. It said there might be a circumstance where we won't, I'm paraphrasing, there might be a circumstance where we won't um, um, enforce this law. But I think that's a remarkable example of law being interpreted within the bureaucracy leading to a stop of a practice against the government's, against the president's wishes. And that's just not just a matter of discretion, it's a matter of law operating. On the accountability question, um, so this is a hard question. I talk about this a lot in my book. There's been, so accountability is not, as you, as you suggested when you said there's maybe been political accountability but not legal accountability. Accountability is a broad term, and, and I think people think about it in terms of criminal law too often, as if that were the only form of accountability. I view accountability as, and I think that there's been extraordinary accountability along many dimensions for the presidency in the last decade. Accountability is when an actor is subject to account before another institution that has the power to punish in some way and to bring change. That, I think, is the general definition of accountability. Now, all of the things that happened, I guess we're talking mostly about the CIA activities, um, all of the things that happened um, uh, have been scrutinized like never before in American history. There have been dozens and dozens of investigations. Those investigations have imposed real costs on lots of people, causing them to lose their job, causing them to lose financial, causing them to lose money, causing extraordinary reputational harm. You're right that there haven't been present criminal prosecutions for, most, for almost all of what the CIA did in the early, um, early years. Now, John Durham said, after looking even at cases going beyond the, uh, what was authorized to the CIA, he said that he did not have the evidence to bring a prosecution, and that's what the DOJ manual basically requires, a probability of prosecution. Um, I think also, however, that there was an element of political calculus by President Obama in not being more aggressive in trying to bring criminal actions against Bush administration officials. I don't think that's illegitimate. I think it's perfectly legitimate. It's a perfectly legitimate element of prosecutorial discretion. The president is supposed to take into account uh, the community concerns in all sorts of ways. And I think President Obama basically said this. He said, first of all, any prosecution of any official from the Bush administration for something that happened early in the war on terrorism would have been enormously controversial no matter how you slice it, first of all. Second of all, it would have been very difficult under any circumstances to get a conviction, I think, in this country, assuming that there was criminal violation. Uh, and that, so the, the, it's quite possible, and I think probably more likely. So and third of all, and, and, and third of all, everything else President Obama was trying to accomplish would have been much harder to accomplish outside of that area. So I do think that there was a calculus brought to bear. But I also think that there was the most vigorous uh, um, um, investigation of that program that's ever been done in American history. And there were serious sanctions doled out of a variety of forms, but they weren't criminal, you're right. Yes.
Hello? 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 Okay. Hi. My name's Ben Davis, University of Toledo. Um, question is the following. To the extent that uh, people know that we tortured, we just had a recent report yesterday of Libyans saying they were waterboarded in um, Afghanistan. To the extent that most Americans feel that they were lied into the war in Iraq, how is it that in this consensus there's any inability of the system or this group that forms our uh, national security strategy or national security group to um, get or be made to bear some kind of accountability for these enormous things that some people call crimes, like lying us into a war or torture in our system. And I understand overseas, how, how is the countervailing effect of things going on overseas? I understand there's an investigation going by the European Court of Human Rights on what happened in the Polish sites right now. And those proxy sites are having their uh, authorities kind of look into things that they did for us. The Italians had a prosecution for one thing that we did. Um, so I, mean, I, I don't think I have much more of an answer than the one I just gave. Um, I do think that there has been extraordinary accountability in the terms of scrutiny, publication of what happened, punishment for some people, not criminal punishment. A and I think that criminal prosecution, which is what er people who want more accountability seem to want, I think it's just not feasible. I think it simply wasn't feasible in this country. Assuming that there were crimes committed, it's very hard to show crimes in these areas. Um, so I guess I disagree with you on the claim that there hasn't been a lot of accountability. I, I don't claim in the book that there's been adequate accountability, by the way. I think whether there's been adequate, my claim is that, is that the claim that there's been not much accountability is simply wrong. There's been extraordinary accountability. Whether it's enough or not is a very difficult normative question in my view that I talk, and I talk about this in the book. Because as I was saying to the, to the past uh, questioner, to determine whether there's adequate accountability, you have to consider all the systemic effects of the accountability that you're talking about, including the systemic effects on national security, the systemic effects on everything else that the government is trying to accomplish. And um, we've had a system that's just doled out extraordinary accountability, a lot of it, whether it's enough or not, I just think it's a very difficult normative question. But I will say this, I think, I feel quite confident, again, I can't prove this, that any attempt to engage in criminal prosecutions against former Bush administration officials, or and I don't know about CIA officials who acted outside of their authority. I don't have privy, I'm not privy to what Durham, the evidence he saw, or what happened. We don't know what the real facts on the ground were. Durham knows, presumably. But I do believe that any attempted prosecution of Bush administration officials would have blown up in the president's face and failed. And I also think one implication of that would have been, and this is you know, counterfactual supposition on top of counterfactual supposition, but I think it's plausible. If that prosecution had failed, I think that the disapprobation that right now that attaches to certain interrogation practices and the taboo that now attaches to certain interrogation practices would have been less so if we had gone through that because there would have been a lot of people in the country rising up to support it. And I think President Obama took all these considerations into account in deciding to do what he did. Yes. I'm Tim Webster, I teach you at Case Western Reserve. Uh, I, I guess I, I agree with your thesis that there's been significant overlaps and continuities between uh, President Obama and, and President Bush with regard to national security. Uh, but I think there are significant differences um, as regards foreign affairs, and I'd one, I'm wondering if you would speak to that. Uh, for example, I think the Bush administration took a much more uh, unilateral approach to decision making, um, they were uh, far more um, able to launch what some people call illegal wars in Iraq. Um, the Obama administration, by contrast, has been uh, far more willing to you know, extend an open hand to Iran, uh, to use military force far more parsimoniously. Um, there's been a strategic pivot away from the Middle East towards Asia. There's been a less strident tone with the Muslim world, um, so I'm wondering, conceding that there's been significant overlaps and continuities in national security, whether you think your thesis would also hold for foreign Yeah, as, again, as I said, at the, I want to take issue with one thing you said, but as I said at the outset, my expertise is not in pure foreign policy, and I wouldn't deny that President Obama has a different foreign policy than President Bush, um, although a lot of people have written about the remarkable similarities and about how a lot of the things uh, that President Obama started, set out to do, ended up looking a lot more like what President Bush uh, might have done. 
But I do want to take issue with, with one ironic claim that you made about the unilateral approach to decision making in war. When President Bush went to war, he got Congress on board. And uh, for his, for both in September 2001 and October 2003, uh, Ben says we were lied to. I don't believe we were lied to. But, but President Bush did get authorization from Congress for his war. President Obama did not in Libya. And President Obama probably is the first president to overtly, in my opinion, violate the War Powers Resolution. <laughs> Uh, again, these are acted against type, but um, uh, I don't think that that, that that particular statement was accurate. But I, I'm, I'm quite willing to concede that in other areas of foreign policy that, uh, and I actually think that some of the factors I talked about, some of the structural factors of national security law apply more to the counterterrorism <coughs> and traditional national security context, unless the president probably does have more discretion on the pure foreign policy, policy issues. So I wouldn't want to deny that there's less continuity there. Uh, Jack, a great presentation, a great book. I just Thank want you. to congratulate you. Uh, interesting issue, the new book, uh, No Easy Day, has come out in which the Navy SEAL says that they went after bin Laden. Well, one of them popped him in the head with, an, uh, you know, with a uh, rifle round. They slowly crept up to the room. They looked in. They found him laying in the door uh, you know, with, with uh, the throes of death, you know, tw uh, I wouldn't, didn't say quivering, but trembling, something like that. No sign he was a threat, and then they pumped several more rounds into his body. Uh, it leads to an, to an issue that's, that's haunted me, but it may be just ignorance. Has this administration taken any detainees? Could, could, could it be that since you can't interrogate them in a method that's likely to get useful information, the word has gotten out, we really don't need any prisoners, and it's better to shoot them a couple more times than to have to feed and house them and worry about all the lawyers. So I haven't read the book. That's a good question, Bob. I haven't read the book. Uh, it may be a war crime. Yeah, it might be. As you describe it, it probably is a war crime. Um, so let me just answer the question at a little bit more abstract level, and that is the question about whether the Obama administration has substituted targeted killing for detention and interrogation. And actually, that was a trend that was going on in the late Bush administration, an emphasis much less on detention and interrogation, which had become legally and politically very hot, and a ramping up, also made, made feasible by technological changes, the huge, sharp improvements in drone technologies and surveillance technologies. Um, but, so, and the Obama administration has relied much, much more heavily on targeted killing strikes and less on detention and interrogation. And this strikes some people as odd because of course, you don't get any due process at all uh, when you're killed by a drone strike. The, civil, the, the, the collateral damage doesn't uh, get any due process, uh, and you're dead. Um, and so that raises the question about whether one is a substitute for the other. So I've talked to a lot of people in the administration about this, and uh, here's what I, I can just tell you what I report. Everyone so at the top of the administration fervently denies that there's any overt policy. And I don't believe that there is an overt policy. Uh, let's just kill them so they won't talk. But I do think, and some people in the military have said, that, that interrogation and detention have become so fraught legally and politically that when it's lawful to kill, that that option is simply a more readily available option for dealing with the enemy. And I think that the trade-off is inev inevitably there. When you make one uh, tool for incapacitating the enemy less available, you're going to use the other tool. And I do think that's happened. I have no idea if it's happened in the bin Laden context, but I do think it's happened more generally. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again, Jack, for a fantastic keynote for this conference. His book, which I'm holding up, is really a great read. Um, so, you know, run out and get it from Amazon or put it on your Kindle. Um, before we uh, take a 15-minute break and then go to some of the panels that Jack previewed in his presentation, um, panels such as the next one on presidential power in a war without end, and then later um, the war powers resolution, I do want to mention that some people have come in, uh, some of which are our co-sponsors. I see um, Betsy Anderson from the American Society of International Law, and the dean in his opening thanked our co-sponsors, but 
there's one person in particular that I want to give a real warm personal thanks to. Um, the dean mentioned that the Wolf Family Foundation has sponsored our annual conference for each of the last eight years. This conference would not be possible without this foundation. It's a local foundation that does great work. And Jim Wolf is here, um, and I just want to thank him again for making all of this possible. Can you just stand up? Jim Wolf. All right, so we're using that clock, and by that clock, we're exactly at time for a break. I'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>